left to uh, the uh, far left here, uh, manufacturing uh, manager and uh, unrepentant Arizona, Kim Ruff. The uh, anti-tax uh, activist and uh, and software IT engineer and taxation is that Herman, activist, <laughs> media entrepreneur, agro guy, and Kodesh Sharif, Clemson University lecturer, and 1996 Libertarian Party vice presidential nominee Joe Jorgensen. I had a write up for Herman, but he then informed me in the uh, in the, the darkroom. Highly respected political satirist, Vernon Supreme. A retired military officer and nonprofit uh, CEO, uh, Ken Osher. I first wonder why these people are here and not other people. It's because the South Carolina Libertarian Party uh, established their own uh, guidelines and criteria, which were basically it had to be constitutionally uh, able to run, you had to file your paperwork, you had to. Uh, I think it was raised five thousand dollars from individual contributors uh, as of Labor Day, um, and be a sustaining member of the uh, Libertarian Party. So, and also get here. So these six people did. Uh, nobody else did. And so here we go. We're going to start like this at the top, starting from Kim Roth on down this way. Uh, everyone's going to give a ninety-second opening statements. These exciting TV monitors here, which all the candidates can see very, very easily, uh, shows them the time of their opening statements. And after that, we will talk more about how things shall proceed. Kim Ruff, you go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kim Ruff, and like everyone on the stage here, I am here because I am seeking the Libertarian Party's nomination for president in 2020. The reason why I'm running is because this is a year where we need to have an unrepentant person standing up and being our standard bearer for the values that define us as libertarians. In 2016, we had two terrible candidates, clearly both vested in the state, and we had an opportunity to shine. Well, we've had four years of Trump. We've seen what that's yields, and we realized the federal government is not the solution. Government, in fact, is not the solution at all for what ails us, because it is indeed what ails us. I'm here to do that and be her standard bearer so our down ballot candidates have someone that they can point to and build off of those talking points where they can achieve what they need to at home. Yeah, you. Yeah. 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 I want to ask you all the candidates, suddenly Jim just embody, you don't have to take up that many seconds. Sometimes it's great when you talk. Go, Dan. Hi, my name is Dan. Taxation is left Berman, and I hate taxes so much I changed my middle name. <laughs> There's this idea that we should trust politicians. I don't know if there's anybody here that trusts politicians, but I certainly don't. There's this idea that we should give them all of our money and just keep our fingers crossed and hope that they do the right thing with it. Well, if you go to a business or a restaurant or anything and you don't like how they treat you, you don't like how their services or their product, you take your money and leave. But what happens with the government when they have a gun to your face and say, if you don't pay it, we're taking you to jail? And if you resist, we might hurt you. What do you say to that government? Can you really trust those politicians? Should we be giving them that much power? Should we blindly hand them our money and trust them to do what's right? I say no. I say taxation is theft. We should decide what we do with our money. This is our society we live in. And we don't need to trust the politicians to create this society for us. We can do it ourselves. As a Marine Corps Reservist in college, I did my semester abroad in Iraq. I volunteered in 2004 and was promoted to Sergeant while deployed with the Civil Affairs Team. During the siege of Fallujah, just west of the Euphrates, Lance Corporal Frank was shot through the armpit bowl from his flak jacket. And while we carried him into a surgical tent and I told him that he was going to be okay, he died from internal bleeding. We said he died a proper warrior's death, but we knew the truth. We had just watched another poor man die in a rich man's war. I'm running for president of the United States with the Libertarian Party to dissolve the federal government in a peaceful, orderly, responsible bankruptcy, giving us 50 independent states 
and up to 562 sovereign native nations. Because I'm tired of this crap. I'm tired of poor men dying to line rich men's pockets, veteran suicides, the drug war destroying lives, countless Americans dying from pharmaceuticals. I'm struggling, of, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of Americans struggling to take care of our kids working paycheck to paycheck because our inheritance and our potential are being stolen from it. If you're as tired as I am, let's take it back. Break free from big government. I'm Dr. Joe Jorgensen, the small government candidate for president, Libertarian Party 2020. If you get your political news from CNN, MSNBC, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you might believe that Americans are at war with each other over politics, culture, the economy. Uh, shouting, denying, screaming, I'm right, you're wrong, fake debates. It would be sad and depressing if that were what America looked like today, but it doesn't. All we see are the same few faces over and over again on TV and on the internet. Most of us, the rest of us, are normal. We can have conversations with our coworkers, our friends, our family, our neighbors. Would you like to have a real conversation about government, politics, economics, and culture? Then welcome to this debate. Big government is the problem, small government is the solution. I'm Joe Jorgensen, and tonight I'll show you why and how we must break free from big government. My boot is a magic boot. This boot has allowed me to amplify my voice my First Amendment freedom of speech exponentially. It has allowed me to communicate with millions of people and media from around the world. This is the magic boot that could bring all the boys and girls to the LP's backyard. What you must know, this boot is not attached to my head. I am not my character. I am not on all the time, and I am not a full-time disruptor. What I am is a very reasonable man with a reasonable offer on the table to offer this boot to the LP to help harness them to bring many, many young people to the yard on the uh, virility of my memeiness on the internet and beyond. Thank you. And Ken Armstrong, please. Hi there, I'm Ken Armstrong. And I, first of all, I just want to say how amazing it is to be on stage at Francis Marion University. Think about this. This place is named for one of our nation's original freedom fighters, a great, true freedom fighter. And I like to think that Francis Marion would be proud of the six people standing on the stage today. I have a fire in my belly for what we're doing. You can't see it, but it's there, I promise. I, I'm, I'm very, very serious about this. My wife, Dawn, and I have put our entire lives on hold. Everything we own is in the back of the car. Our buddy Earl has been diligently driving us from whistle stop to whistle stop. But we have put ourselves on hold, and we have met hundreds of people in the 40 states that we've been to so far, eight more to visit in the continental United States. But we passionately want to participate in the change that this country needs to see. All right, so let's explain how this is going to go. Uh, I will ask questions. Most of them will be same question for all six candidates to ponder and discuss. They will have 60 seconds with which to answer. Again, the monitor is right there. If they happen to name somebody else or call somebody out in some way that deserves or merits a response, that person will then have 30 seconds to respond. And I will choose the order. I should say I will uh, delegate the choosing of the order by pressing this magic a button on random.org uh, as opposed to uh, trying to think through it myself. Uh, so this first question um, will go to uh, Adam Kokesh uh, and it will go to everybody else, but he'll take first a crack at it. 
uh, this week, there's been some large amounts of news on a topic that has been divisive to a lot of libertarian or libertarian leaners, both in terms of audience uh, and also legislators. And that is the House of Representatives voting to launch an inquiry of impeachment against President Donald Trump. My question to you, Adam Kokash, and everybody else is, had you been in Congress, would you have voted yes? And then also, in your judgment, from what we know so far, has the president engaged in impeachable conduct that's worth voting him out? I would absolutely <clears throat> vote for impeachment, not just for President Trump, but for every member of Congress, myself included. Has Donald Trump committed impeachable conduct? Different scholars will draw the line in different places, but it really doesn't matter. Has he engaged in criminal conduct? Absolutely. And that's what matters. Because this is a fundamentally criminal government that is unfit to exist. Kim Ruff. No, I would not necessarily have voted in favor of it because the grounds upon which it hinges is specious. However, I do think that there's plenty of things that you could hold Trump accountable for and could indeed impeach him for, one of which is continuing the unconstitutional war in Yemen. But of course, in order to do that, you would also have to go after Obama for starting it, and that would make the whole thing unravel. Right now, it's just political theater. They're doing it because they're trying to put themselves in position to look like the better option in 2020 but we obviously know they're not. Ken Armstrong, would you have voted to impeach? And do you think there's impeachable conduct there? Uh, well, yes, I do think there's impeachable conduct, but beyond that, I think that, uh, that the entire government is proving to us that it's time for a change. And uh, I'll just say quite simply, I, we're ready to be that change right now. Dan, taxation is theft, Berman. I don't know if voting for impeachment is the right thing. I mean, I really think there should be a continuous impeachment proceeding all the time for every single president, including myself, because, I mean, really, shouldn't we be keeping a pretty close eye on these guys and what they're doing? They're, they're doing so many things. They're continuing drone bombings. Um, they're continuing illegal tax collection. They're continuing seizing property and, and territories from other places. They're engaging in criminal wars. I, I think absolutely we need that to continue going, but I don't think it's something we should, we should have a voting process holding up. I think that's something that should just always be there. Vermin Supreme. Yes, sure, why not? Looks constitutional and probably. Outstanding. <laughs> you should work in journalism. Uh, and Joe Jorgensen, take us out. No, I would not vote to impeach. However, I think we need to look at all the congressmen, all of the senators, because yes, government has gone far beyond the scope that was constitutionally uh, uh, acceptable. So we need to look at the entire government and break free from big government and make government small. Thank you. Round two, the random generator likes Adam Kokesh, so he will again be the first to answer the following question. Another uh, bit of news this week, I think it happened on Friday, Senator Elizabeth Warren, a leading candidate for president, came out with uh, what she says is her plan to pay for Medicare for all uh, against the backdrop, of course, of a $23 trillion national debt and all kinds of uh, entitlements and, and things going forward. Trying to narrow the question, I would say this. Um, what do you think should be done, particularly from the federal government's point of view, to Medicare, Medicare itself, and especially with the, in mind of people who have been promised to receive it or who are receiving it right now? Localize it. Get it down to the state level for starters, ultimately down to the city level. This is what this campaign platform is based on. And this is what unites people. And I'm just going to. All right, it's working. No? All right. To mention some of the. Co Steel dance. See? Are we good? All right. <laughs> Furman. At least the clock is paused. Are we good? All right, I'll run through this really. Either. Is it me? There you go. Uh, is there a bug somewhere? 
<laughs> All right. Um, a big part of this idea of localization is that it really unites people and brings people together. And we have a huge group of coalitions, Military for Kokesh with Afghanistan veteran Adam House, Felons for Kokesh with Norman Somerville, who is an actual felon, Stoners for Kokesh with none other than G.I. Mary Jane, the commander in chief herself, Joey Lee, Women for Kokesh, gun owners, GSM, Christians, gamers, all great coalitions. But today I want to introduce Chris Cole, with victims of family law for Kokesh. He is a survivor of a brutal divorce and custody battle here with his two sons, six and three. And he's a father who wants to end the family court racket so that his kids will never have to fear being taken away from them by government. It is a, it is a shame that we live in a country where that's a reality. Getting government down to the community level unites people, brings people in, and that's what we have the potential to do with this message. Thank you, Thanks Adam. for the, is that the a, time and mic flexibility that, there, everybody. Is that a goat being sacrificed in the front row? That's, that's the best like buzzer I've heard. That's great. Uh, Vermin Supreme, Medicare, Elizabeth Warren. What would you do with Medicare, Vermin Supreme? Well, in the hypothetical and highly unlikely situation that I was president of America, the president can only do so much, blah, blah, blah. Um, of course, those who have uh, been promised Medicare and are receiving it under previous agreement and, and uh, veterans who are receiving vet care, uh, these are contracts. Uh, they're, uh, so the U.S. government obviously contractually obligated to uphold them at some point. So I would uh, maintain that's an important thing, whether that's through their privatization of it, as long as they can guarantee that care. And um, other than that, of course, uh, privatize it, free market uh, platitudes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Kim Ruff. Well, the ideal answer for us as libertarians is that we would want to privatize health care. You have a right to life, but you don't have a right to health care. However, we are in a situation where we have made a commitment to people that who have banked on having that health care. So in order to phase it out entirely, we would have to basically put a moratorium on it, no new entrance. Anyone that we made a commitment to, we would continue to pay on that until that commitment runs its course. And then hopefully from that point on, it would become privatized and people would stop looking to government for the answer. Jim, Joe Jorgensen, Medicare. I think all libertarians understand that Medicare for all means Medicare for none. The problem with the old two parties is they keep focusing on how are we going to pay these bloated prices. Under their policy, expenses keep going up and up and up. What I would do is I would look at cutting the cost side so that expenses go down. And of course, we need as many people into the free market as possible. That's part of the problem with Medicare is there are no free market competition. There's no free market competition to hold costs down. But to answer your last question, absolutely, I would follow through on the government, uh, following through on helping those who need it. Dan, taxation is theft, Berman, Medicare. Well, taxation is theft, and that kind of ruins the whole uh, healthcare system that we have right now. I've been to so many other countries, and I spend most of my time in Mexico, and I've really seen what happens. It's illegal to import medication into the United States that you can buy cheaper outside of the United States. And it's not because they're worried about quality control or anything like that. It's actually manufactured in the United States and exported, and you just can't bring it back in. And it's cheaper in other countries because they know people can't afford it. But here, they know they can price gouge us. They know we have all these systems in place where the government's going to have to pay for it. Really, the Democrats, as much as, as it sounds like maybe they're well-intentioned to say, look, we want to make sure that everybody has health care. It's a wonderful plan. Their plan is going to continue to keep the prices high. It's going to continue to keep the 1% of the corporations making millions of dollars on their investments, on their protected monopolies. And we are just going, all they're doing is they're getting more people to pay for it. They're getting more people to share and that 1% is still gonna get it. That means the healthy people are also gonna be paying, the sick people are gonna be paying, and it's a ripoff. Ken Armstrong. Well, our simple libertarian answer is obviously that the government doesn't uh, make things more affordable and, and everything they run, they run into the ground. So uh, clearly I'm, I'm not in favor of a Medi Medicare for all plan, but bigger than that is the, the damage that is being done to our children and our grandchildren by this mountain of debt that we're accruing right now. Uh, it, our, our debt to, to gross domestic product ratio right now is 103%. We owe more than we're making. 
And, and you know, if, if you did that in your own life, that spells bankruptcy. I think right now we've got the right guy in the White House to manage a bankruptcy. He's been pretty good at that in the past, so maybe that's what he has in mind. All right. Uh, the uh, random uh, generator here wants Vermin Supreme to ask the, or to answer the following uh, question first. Uh, again, ripped out of the news over the last uh, couple of weeks, President Trump announced that we were that he was going to withdraw or transfer some U.S. troops out of the Kurdish-controlled part of Syria, uh, kind of get them out of the way for Turkey to do uh, what Turkey did, which is engage in um, in some atrocities in in Turkey. The president sold this as, hey, we should stop doing regime change wars in the Middle East, which I think a lot of people on the stage and in this room would ag agree with. Um, so there's a two-part question. Um, and maybe in mind with uh, your recent appearance on the uh, WTF uh, podcast uh, as well. Um, two-part is, just how do you assess what Trump did in with the troops in Syria, period? How, well, what do you think about that? And then, perhaps trickier, um, assuming as most libertarian candidates uh, uh, favor withdrawing U.S. troops wherever and whenever possible. How do you do it in such a way that it doesn't end in atrocities? Uh, well, I, I believe there were so few troops involved that it was very marginal, and uh, he did not really withdraw them. He just moved, he shuffled them around, essentially sold out the Kurds, and uh, that certainly stiffs the U.S. in any sort of foreign entanglements that they might want to uh, enter into the future. Um, I think we can just take it back to the basic uh, libertarian platform that we do not stand for any uh, foreign entanglements and uh, that we do we maintain a military only as big as we uh, need to protect ourselves from a foreign invasion and uh, that we keep it keep it real and keep it chill and uh, don't don't be uh, going over uh, seas to all these uh, wars and endless wars, et cetera. So I, I think it's a, as far as Trump's little move, it's an illusion. It's a geopolitical fuck up. Um, and uh, what was the rest of the question? That's about it, yeah. Okay. And, and once again, I am working on uh, universal pony care for all. You do get an apple a day, a sugar cube if you've been really nice. Unfortunately, if you break a leg, we have to put you down. It's the longest I've ever heard Vermin go before bringing up the uh, pony care. Uh, Joe Jorgensen uh, assessing what the President Trump did with troops in Syria, and then also the question of how do you manage sort of U.S. imperial withdrawal in such a way to not leave uh, populations vulnerable. Well, I certainly agree with Trump that we need to bring our troops home. If elected president, I would turn America into one giant Switzerland, armed and neutral, but enough forces to protect and defend American soil and American shores. I would refuse to send one more young person over to foreign land to vote for foreign dictators for foreign intentions. In the end, I'm looking for peace, but peace through being one giant Switzerland. Adam Kokesh, you started tonight talking about your own uh, history. What, what do you think about Trump's move and how to manage withdrawal? Well, I actually think uh, Vermin's summation of the deception there was, was right on. That it, It's just the implant interfering with the signal. I'm, I'm serious. All right, well, should, we, should we keep going with this one? Yeah, yeah all right. Time, all right. <laughs> uh, there's so much deception in our foreign policy. We get it through a corrupt mainstream media. We know that it's built on lies, but even deeper than that, that Neither? Did, what did you do? All right, I just get to stand a little closer to my friend Dan here. All right. It's obviously a very personal subject for me, so it's not hard to, to get to, to the importance of this because we are talking about matters of life and death. And you can't just talk about it as a matter of policy and the principle that's behind the message of libertarianism, of freedom, is so critical to a strong national defense. The fact is, Having a military makes us less safe. That's why the founders were against a standing army. And I don't just mean in the sense of the foreign adventurism that I was a part of and all the, the terrorists that we made by killing their families when they were innocent. 
But in a more fundamental sense, there's a reason why the founders advocated for a militia-based defense, a rifle behind every blade of grass. You want to be like Switzerland? Take the defense away from the government. Give it back to the people. Kim Ruff. First question was, how do I assess what Trump did? Yes. Usually with politics, what happens is we are fed one thing. We're told that this is being done in the best interest of X, Y, Z. And then invariably what they do is not any even close to that. In this case, Vermin is absolutely right on the money. He was effectively sidestepping. We didn't take anybody back home. We said the words, but we didn't bring anybody back. We just said it. Insofar as preventing a vacuum that creates a terrible atrocity to occur, well, terrible atrocities will occur whether or not we create a vacuum. And that is the lie that has been perpetuated forever to keep us involved in these entanglements. I reject it wholesale. What goes on in other countries is not our problem. We are not the world's police. It is not our job to have our finger in every pie. We have a responsibility to care for ourselves here at home. Instead of sending our men and women overseas to die on other soil and kill those there, let us come home completely. Ken Armstrong, who has a bit more experience with NATO, I think, than most people on the stage. That's right. I'm a former NATO base commander and a NATO UN advisor in the Bosnian War. And the thing that I learned being in that kind of service is that war is a horrible thing. Uh, I don't love war any more than a firefighter loves fires. Um, I will say that uh, it's probably the one and only time this evening that you'll, say, you'll hear me say that I agree with Donald Trump. But I agree that we needed to pull the, the young American service members out of Syria. The problem is not that he did it. The problem is the way that he did it, and we could go into that for hours. But then he turned around and sent 3,000 young people to Saudi Arabia. Now, he's saying that they're advisors. If they were advisors, they could Skype it in from poolside in Vegas. <laughs> they don't need to go to... They're going there as human shields. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, take us home. Is this on? To quote Ron Paul, we just marched in, we can just march out. Now, I know a lot of people, they're worried because there are some pretty nasty people around the world, dictators, organizations that want to do some really bad things. But it's not our government's job to steal from people, to pay for arms, to send people over to these other places who have nothing to do with it and force them to surrender their lives for these causes. We need to, something else that, that not a whole lot of people are talking about is we need to ground the drones. These drones are out there blowing up schools, hospitals, and weddings. It's, it's insane what we're doing. Now, the concern is what do we do about all, this, all these tragedies around the world with all these dictators? There are plenty of people who are from there who I know people personally who have gone to these places from America to go fight for their family, some as soldiers, some as doctors. We can all do that voluntarily, but we can't steal from people and force others to engage in these things. Thank you, Dan. The uh, randomizer, again, likes Adam Kokesh, who will get the uh, first crack at the following question. Uh, we are uh, living through uh, what I think can safely be described as a bipartisan um, anti-social media freakout. Um, there's a bit of a panic, uh, or, or at least a very concentrated amount of concern uh, uh, paid towards Trump the, derangement syndrome. Um, no, no, no. Uh, it's, uh, it's more like a Silicon Valley derangement syndrome, if anything else. Both uh, Democratic Party and Republican Party each in their different ways are agreeing on new ideas about regulating Facebook, regulating Twitter, um, gotcha. talking about uh, uh, what kind of advertisement should be uh, allowed, not even like getting into algorithms. Ted Cruz is very, very upset about right. how many retweets he's getting and not getting. Uh, so my question is, um, in your assessment, do, do the big tech companies, your Amazon, your Google, your Apple, um, Facebook, Twitter, do they have too much power? Just especially on things having to do with free speech. And then what, if anything, should the federal government do about that? That's a great question. I have, well, is that, is that a little too loud for everybody? I have to moderate it a bit. Love All right. Uh, 
This is an issue that's a little personal to me from having built a career around a YouTube channel. Spent a lot of time, put a lot of hours in, building it up to a quarter million subs, some 70 something million views, and used to be able to make an income doing that. This has affected a lot of YouTubers, a lot of people in independent media, a lot of people you know who you might have gotten your news from in the past. And right now, we're getting proportionally to those subscribers about 1 25th of the exposure that we're supposed to get. It's really easy to complain. This is a huge problem. And it's really tempting to turn to government and say, let's break up the monopolies. Let's, let's fight this power that shouldn't exist. Are they too powerful? Absolutely. But more importantly, their power is not legitimate. It comes from a government policy of corporatism that favors big business. You take that away, if they're going to be powerful, make, it, make them earn it and subject them to real competition. Ken Armstrong. Is big tech too big? And does the government have a role in changing the federal government the, the way that it is regulated? You know, it seems to me that a real good idea for government is if anybody ever starts making trouble for them, they ought to just regulate the hell out of them because that'll make sure that they can't make trouble anymore. I think the, the biggest problem with social media uh, although I do absolutely agree that uh, federal regulations, corporatist mentality and government have made them bigger than they need to be. But the biggest problem with social media is the problem they present for the government because the government has such a hard time controlling them. Kim Ruff. With respect to the question on whether or not these tech companies have too much power, only in the sense that they do get benefits from the existence of government. They're too entrenched and they are powerful because of that symbiotic relationship. If that symbiotic relationship was completely destroyed and it was indeed left up to the free market to decide, any success that they have would be on their own merit. And so far as politicians being bothered about not getting the tweets that they desired, well, maybe you should step up your game and your content. <laughs> Joe Jorgensen, is big tech too big and should something be done? Yes, big tech is too big. However, we've got to look at how it got there to begin with. Yes, corporate uh, legislation and rules have gotten us there. But also what a lot of people don't look at is some of the government research and some of the government practices given away free to some of these companies and so rather than doing their own R&D or rather than inventing their own things, uh, taxpayers end up helping them create some of these platforms and then they get to profit from us, not the taxpayers. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman. Yes, these businesses are too big. Yes, they have too much power. And yes, something should be done about it. We should leave. We have the freedom to leave, and there are so many other platforms out there. The problem is most people look at those platforms and say, oh, well, that's not legitimate. Why aren't they legitimate? Why don't they have that feeling of legitimacy? Why? Because where's Trump? Trump's on Twitter. Where are all the people on CNN and, and all the big name mainstream media? Where are they? They're all on Twitter, Facebook. Some of them are getting on Instagram and some of the newer ones, YouTube. But guess what? None of them are moving over to other places that, that are considered dark web, maybe. Um, but there are so many other places that we can take our business. And when we do that, we get the real message by sites that are not using algorithms to filter what we see. But the reality is people don't want to because they feel safe on Facebook. You could go to Reddit. That's almost mainstream. And there's a lot of information there. But a lot of people get angry when they go to Reddit. They get into fights. So they feel much safer with their friends and family back over on Facebook. This is a change that needs to come from the people not from government. And vermin supreme. Agreed all around. Uh, yes, it's very big, and yes, something should be done. Um, as a meme, of course, I would cease to exist if it was not for the internet. So I welcome the internet. I love the internet like Brett Kavanaugh loves beer. <laughs> and um, so I, I just think it's very important that we should really um, free up all the censorship, all the government regulations over the uh, internet needs to be uh, destroyed, all those ridiculous uh, alphabet soup things that they uh, put forth to uh, uh, gum up the works, if you will, need to be uh, thrown by the wayside. And yes, free the internet, free the people, uh, decentralize, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Free Mark. 
So the uh, the randomizer wants uh, Dan Taxationist Theft Berman to answer the following question uh, first. We are living through a moment when almost all of the Democratic presidential ca candidates are in favor of legalizing marijuana. This was not the case four years ago, and it certainly was never the case before that. Um, it's becoming uh, it's legal now in how many states, people? Nine, something like that, recreationally. Um, definitely the momentum is going this way. This, uh, this direction. So libertarians who've been talking about this since libertarians were a thing, um, from your perspective, what are the Democrats getting wrong in the way that they are going about legalizing marijuana and doing these kind of overdue criminal justice reforms? I think what they're doing wrong is they're they're trying to do what they do best, be government and micromanage our lives. They see that the people want legalized cannabis and they say, okay, fine, we'll give it to you, but just a little taste. We're not gonna give you the whole thing. We wanna control how much you have. We wanna make sure the packages are labeled. We wanna make sure you can only buy it from people who are paying us enormous fees, taxes, people that we can rob. You have to buy it from them. You can't just, you can't grow your own, or if you do, you're very limited in what you can do. Not a single one of them will say, you're free people, go do whatever you want. That's their problem. They don't understand or respect freedom. Kim Ruff, in what way are our new weed legalizing friends in the Democratic Party doing it wrong? They are doing it wrong in the sense that just as Dan said, they are trying to effectively regulate it to the point of not even, it's a, it's a pittance, basically. You have the ability to have marijuana. However, you have to pay licenses if you want to be a distributor. You have to get a medical marijuana ID in Arizona, in our case, if you want to consume it. You have to pay taxes on it. So they're still very heavily entrenched in your lives. The best way for them to actually deal with it effectively is to tackle it on the federal level and completely end the war on drugs. As it stands, at least in the state of Arizona where both Adam and I live, we have medical marijuana. However, because of overarching federal legislation, if I wanted to get a medical ID card, well then I can kiss my firearms goodbye because I won't be sold any. So that's where we really need to tack it, is at the federal level. And that's where they're failing. Joe Jorgensen, what can libertarians teach Democrats about criminal justice reform? Yes, first of all, there is still a law, a federal law outlawing it. So that's the first thing that needs to be done, is to get rid of the federal law. Uh, as, as a federal candidate, that's all I could do. However, I can speak and I would talk with state representatives and local representatives. And for instance, in California, there are still places where you have to get a license in order to, or, uh, in order to open up a store, for instance. You have to get a certain license. Uh, something like 40% of what customers pay go straight to the government. And in fact, instead of uh, illegal marijuana going down, it's actually gone up because it's still just as profitable because it's uh, controlled so much by the government. So what we need to do is get rid of those regulations and make it truly illegal and not just pay lip service to the word illegal or legal. Adam Kokesh. <laughs> it's a good call, really. Time flies when you're having fun, huh? All right. Well, I love this issue. Thank you for bringing it up, Matt and uh, Vermin. It's not just because uh, I love weed as much as Brett Kavanaugh loves beer, but uh, it's such an important subject to the understanding of freedom. How many of you think Cheeto Jesus never smoked pot? I mean, that's insane. And the fact that he is overseeing a system that criminalizes marijuana smokers is the height of hypocrisy. And it's so obvious, it's so laid bare now in the age of the internet. The reason this is an important issue that really gets to the heart of freedom and is such an effective gateway, I'm proud to say that we have stoners for Kokesh now with GI Mary Jane leading the cause here. Because when you realize that government says, you can't put that in your body, they're saying, you don't own yourself. And the millennial generation, people who grew up in the age of the internet, we're not gonna put up with that crap any longer. This is the end of the drug war. We get to make it happen. Vermin Supreme. 
Free the weed, free the people, let my people go. Release all nonviolent offenders. I smoke dope, I smoke grass. If you don't like it, you can kiss my ass. The government has no business in this business, and the government has no business doing any business, period. Thank you very much. I'm Vermin Supreme. And Ken Armstrong. You know, there's not a single right that we have that the government gives us. We give the government a very narrow and enumerated set of rights, and controlling what we do in the privacy of our own lives is really not the right of the government. So the question of legalizing marijuana has nothing to do with whether I like marijuana or don't like marijuana. Any more than free speech, it it depends on whether what you say is something I like or not. It is your right to live freely in your life, period. Next round of questioning will start with Kim Ruff, uh, perhaps appropriately enough, since it's about what someone might do in the practical world of being a president, which is a a note that you hit. Uh, A president, the executive branch, has a lot of leeway, as we have seen the last three years, uh, in enforcing and setting the terms of immigration law in particular. It's a federal government role, much more than a state government role, uh, and numbers of refugees can change, and all kinds of different things can change. So thinking about being the president of the United States, what would you change in the current way that the executive branch is enforcing or regulating or dealing with immigration as it stands now? Okay. (laughs) All right. Well, as libertarian advocates for the free movement of people, there should be no restraints or constrictions to who comes here if they want to be here, just as there should be no restraints on to who wants to leave should they desire to do so. You should not restrict the movement of people, period. In so far as the federal government goes, we have created all these absurd constraints and criteria for whether or not you qualify to come here and live in America. And a lot of them are incredibly punitive to some of the places where we've been trifling in their foreign affairs. This concern about refugees from Syria, this concern about people from the Middle East who want to come here and we're afraid we're going to end up with terrorists, well, we created that very situation when the CIA went in and overthrew the Shah. This happens over and over and over again. If we want to actually allow people to be truly free, we have to radically change our foreign policy approach. That's where we start, and we allow people to come in and live here and contribute to our economy by being part of our brain trust. Vermin Supreme, how does the pony toothbrush uh, regime uh, affect immigration? I read 3.4 from the Libertarian Party platform, free trade and migration. We support the removal of government impediments uh, to free trade, political freedom, and escape from tyranny, demand that individuals not be unreasonably constrained by government in the crossing of political boundaries. Economic freedom demands the unrestricted movement of human as well as financial capital across national borders. That's all. Joe Jorgensen. First, I'd like to say I'm the grandchild of immigrants. Yes, I believe in immigration. Yes, we need to have more productive people come into our country. Right now, it takes about eight years even for those who can come over. So we need to speed that up, and we need to uh, certainly knock down some of those barriers and get as many people here as we can who can help improve our country. Ken Armstrong, what should the executive branch do? How should the president change his or her approach? Towards well, I'd like to say that we could have everything we want all at once, but sometimes you have to move the ball down the field incrementally. You don't get to make a touchdown on every play. But what I would love to do in the first increment is establish an international free trade zone on certainly on our southern border, could go on our northern border as well, have it be a totally voluntary opt-in sort of thing. We're not going to confiscate any land, but the people who own the land at the borders can decide whether they want to sell it to entrepreneurs to, to operate in the free trade zone. We can have cultural exchange in the free trade zone. I'm going to borrow one idea from from uh, my friend Larry Sharp, who said that we should have two Ellis Islands on the southern border. And I really think that's a wonderful idea inside the free trade zone. Have consular offices open 24 hours a day because one of the biggest problems that we have is visa overstays. We need to make consular offices available. 
Dan, taxation is theft. Berman as the only person up here whose candidate campaign office is headquartered in Cancun. That's right. So one thing that I think is really important to understand with immigration is the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The entire immigration debate is driven by fear. We're told, oh, there's rapists and murderers coming. There are plenty of those in cities like, I don't know if I should name them, but Detroit and some of the other ones that have higher crime rates than most of the cities in Mexico. But we're told we should be afraid of Mexico. Are people migrating out of Detroit into all these other cities and sending all their bad people and drugs and everything? No. Are all the drugs coming out of Colorado into the other states now that, now that cannabis is legal? Not really, not any more than it was before. But all of this is fear driven and most of this is just completely irrational fear. And so we need to really understand and, and when people talk about this, we need to reassure people that if we fix some of the bigger problems first, like the war on drugs, then any problems that might actually exist will actually go away because the war on drugs is happening on both sides of the border and it's gonna happen until it's over. And it doesn't matter how solid that border is. We need to end the war on drugs. Thank you, Dan. And Adam Kokesh, you're the last here, and maybe you can uh, address it from your standpoint of someone who wants to put the federal government into bankruptcy and have a lot of localization. Immigration has largely been a, a federal uh, concern. How does your approach square with that? My second favorite socialist running for president after Tulsi Gabbard is the orange creamsicle in the White House. And it is maddening. It is absolutely maddening to hear people speak out against socialism and all the ills of it and then say, oh, but that doesn't apply to border control. Oh, that doesn't apply to the military. Oh, that doesn't apply to the police. No, the exact same problems with socializing defense and protection services and public safety services are just as bad as with anything else. And when you see how that ill has plagued America, you understand why we are failing so bad in these regards. As it comes to borders, the question is not how to manage government borders. The question is, are we going to embrace the reality that the only legitimate borders are private property borders and that government borders can't exist as enforcement points in respect for private property. You have the right to decide who you associate with and the only way that right is gonna be exercised is if we get government out of the way. I appreciate uh, Adam's uh, name check of Tulsi Gabbard because that's gonna lead us to our next round of question who's uh, the first uh, recipient or answerer uh, will be uh, Kim Ruff here. And this will be the, uh, the final question of the first half of the debate. I'm arbitrarily creating halves here since we got a late start. Uh, and Dan Fish will, will get up after this question and give uh, a little tap dance, a little soft shoe, uh, and then we'll uh, go in the second half uh, getting a little bit more personal about uh, things hopefully. Um, uh, but anyways, um, so Tulsi Gabbard, there are, uh, she's a, a fan of, or you know, there's a lot of libertarians who are fans of hers, a lot of Ron Paul fans who are interested in her anti-war candidacy. There are also a couple of Republicans who are running who have a history with either the Libertarian Party, as Bill Weld does, or with the word libertarian. Mark Sanford has, has described himself that way for 15, 20 odd years um, and is running a campaign about the debt. Question to you is, which person currently running in one of the two bigger parties for president, would you welcome the most to drop what they're doing and join the Libertarian Party? Oh, God. Matt. Oh, come on. <laughs> Talk about a gotcha question. Who would I welcome the most? Well, if you're really going to make me do the lesser of two evils, then I suppose I'll go with Tulsi. But above and beyond that, I don't think any of them would necessarily qualify as libertarians. There's a lot to our belief system, and it all hinges on this core respect of human rights, our natural rights to life, liberty, and property. She's right on the money with her anti-war stance, and I greatly appreciate the fact that she's actually putting it out there, and to some extent, mainstream media is picking up on it, because the anti-war left has been suspiciously silent for a very, very long time. However, she also wants to give you a chicken in every pot. 
and Medicare for all, and make sure that you have, you know, basic minimum, like universal basic income, which is antithetical to what we believe because that's a redistribution of wealth, which is theft, and we reject it wholesale. So while they might be a little bit right, and I appreciate they're a little bit right, they're not libertarians, so I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with them running on our ticket. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, not even a question about running, but like, just come on in. Drop your party affiliation. I would like you, out of all the people running, to join us based on the values that I see that you have. Oh, based on their values? I would absolutely say Bernie Sanders, because I think that might be the only chance I actually have to debate him. Um, <laughs> Bernie's, Bernie's an interesting guy, and I get why a lot of people like him, because he, he gives the vibe that he really cares about people and he wants to help people. Um, he points out some real problems, the, the, you know, the big 1% and the corporations and everything. Of course, he's completely clueless as to why they're the 1%, why they have power, and how to stop them. But I, I think he does bring attention to those points really well. And I would absolutely love to debate him on how to solve that problem by getting government out of the way, which gives those big corporations the power that they have so that we can actually be free and we can actually get rid of those by voluntarily taking our money elsewhere. Ken Armstrong, choose a major party libertarian. Yeah, okay. Well, I have to say first, in uh, I was twice elected to office in Honolulu County, nonpartisan office. I knew Mike Gabbard, Tulsi's dad. Didn't know him well, but I knew the guy, and I knew him by reputation as well. And the family has a great deal of integrity, even though I disagree with them on nearly everything. But I have to say, that said, just based on the integrity, the only person on either side right now that has the integrity that I believe we need to really deal with the truth in the Libertarian Party would be Tulsi. Vermin Supreme. Let's see, we already had Weld, right? <laughs> I believe someone wanna check the bylaws on that one, but I, I believe the answer is yes. Okay, well maybe we could send Beto to the freaking re-education center and teach him how to learn to love guns. He'd be okay. Joe Jorgensen. So do I get to pick from either party? Yes, uh, okay. but it has to be a candidate, for, a declared candidate for presidents of the Democratic or Republican Party. Okay, being in this part of the state of South Carolina, I believe he's still a candidate. I think the right answer is Mark Sanford. Mark Sanford acted like a libertarian through most of his political career, and a lot of people here were big fans. Even after his um, horrible indiscretion, the people of uh, the state still elected him back to Congress. Uh, he's libertarian at heart. And while I commend Tulsi Gabbard for her good no war stance, everything else about her is just wrong. I don't see any other libertarian leanings in her, but I do see many libertarian leanings in Mark Sanford. And Adam Kokesh, will you be the only person sticking up for Bill Weld? I'm wasting all my time shaking my head here. Matt, you want me to tell you who my favorite current Republican or Democrat presidential candidate is right now? Yeah. No, I'm sorry, I do not have a favorite flavor of cancer. <laughs> now, what we're doing with this platform of localization is bringing people together. The politics of the duopoly is about divisiveness. And I was so excited this morning, it was like a, a second Christmas already, waking up this morning to an endorsement from former Green Party presidential candidate and six-term congresswoman from Georgia, Cynthia McKinney. And I'm very excited that she, in that endorsement statement, is actually encouraging people to come in to the Libertarian Party to be unified around this message of localization. I'm also the only candidate in this race who has been, as in my congressional race, endorsed by Ron Paul, and unfortunately will be the only one since he doesn't endorse libertarians as long as Rand is in the Senate. But I think what we have proven is that this is a message that can bring people in from both parties. Thank you, Adam. Thus concludes our first half. We're gonna welcome uh, Dan Fishman from the National Libertarian Party to come up and say a few words. Candidates, if you wanna go out and, and vape or whatever for uh, the 90 seconds, feel free. Otherwise, stay up here, Dan.
Thank you, Matt. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Dan. Yeah, please give these guys a quick round of applause. My name is Dan Fishman. I am the executive director of the Libertarian Party. And I'm going to ask you guys a very simple question. Everybody who owns your own phone, please raise your hand. Yeah, see, everybody raised their hand. And a lot of you are like, well, that's a dumb question. Everybody here who's old enough when it was illegal to own a telephone in the United States, please raise your hand. That's right. A lot of people remember those days. It used to be, in fact, until uh, the end of the AT&T breakup that it was illegal to own a phone. In 1913, AT&T had a monopoly on long distance. A lot of companies sold uh, local telephone service, but AT&T was the only one who started to build long distance. And so they started connecting city to city. And eventually, when they would make a partner and buy up a local company, that local company would run, would win, because everybody wants long distance. When that happened, AT&T started to get a monopoly on all telephone service, and the government recognized it. And in 1930, they had a thing called the Kingsbury Commitment, where the government said to AT&T, we know that you're a monopoly, but what you're doing is so awesome that we're going to let you have that monopoly, and we're not going to break it up, in return for which you, we want you to agree to these regulations. And one of them was that AT&T could not uh, change the connection to a telephone. So whatever was the connection that worked in 1913, AT&T said, all right, we will not use our monopoly to make everybody buy a new telephone. However, in return for that, we want to agree that people can't actually own telephones. We are going to rent all the telephones in the United States. And so I grew up in an era when that was totally true. You look at the bottom of your phone, it would say, owned by AT&T. And in fact, AT&T would sometimes try to catch you and see if you had an extra phone in your house. And if you did, you would get fined. People remember party lines at the time. There used to be all these different connections. Eventually, one of the things that AT&T had agreed to was that they would provide the same speed access to everybody. The government said, you can't use your monopoly to uh, have people in Peoria have a terrible connection. And so AT&T said, okay, that's fine. But they realized as data started to come online, that they couldn't live up to that anymore. They were prevented from innovating because they had to provide the same speed of connection in Peoria that they did in New York City. So finally, AT&T went to the government and they said, look, this is killing us. This agreement that we had uh, where you sort of gave us a monopoly, it's stopping us from innovating. It's stopping us from changing the field. Let us out of it. So the government ended up breaking up AT&T. A bunch of companies that uh, had a lot of land, for example, uh, Southern Pacific Railroad International said, well, we can use our land to run long distance wires and compete with AT&T. And so Southern Pacific Railroad International became Sprint. The other long distance companies that you've heard of, they came in and they started competing against AT&T. This is about 1982. Now remember that deal that they said that they had to keep phones the same from 1913. So from 1913 to 1982, Phones really didn't change that much. But when the government regulation ended from 1982 to 2012, how much did phones change? Unbelievably, when government gets out of the way, innovation happens. We are lucky to have with us presidential candidates who recognize the fact that government has to get out of the way. We are running as a party the only people who say that government is the worst thing that can happen to people. Because government is restriction. Government is regulation. Government is a, is a fiction by which everybody agrees to live at the behest of everybody else. When we talk about what our candidates are standing for right now, we talk about what the Libertarian Party represents. We're talking about candidates who are saying, that no, saying stuff that nobody else is saying. Uh, the candidates are getting ready to come back. And so I want to ask you to help these candidates. One of the things that we've done, one of the important statistics, is that only three parties have ever had 50 state ballot access in two consecutive elections. The Republicans, the Democrats, and the Libertarians. We're getting ready to do it again. We actually lost, we did not have 50 state ballot access in 2012. We got it again in 2016. And we want to have it again in 2020. We are in better shape than any third party has ever been, but we need you to help us. So please, on those phones that we are talking about, 
lp.org slash ballot access. It's very easy for you to help us. Uh, I live in a state in Maryland where it's going to probably going to cost us about $85,000 for ballot access. So anything you can do to help these candidates be on the, on the stage, on the ballot, in all 50 states, would be greatly appreciated. One last thing, look up all of these candidates afterwards. They need your support. Every one of these candidates had to pay for themselves to travel here. Joe didn't come that far, but she's going to have to go other places after this. It's important that you support these candidates because they're representing something that's so vital to your life, like a cell phone, representing the end of government intrusion. So I want to hand it back to Matt. Thank you guys very much. LP.org slash ballot access. Thank you, Dan. I uh, also want to, um, to uh, shout out to... Uh, to the uh, South Carolina Libertarian uh, Party uh, in preparation of all this, uh, if you look on the website, they have uh, they asked the same uh, uh, 10 questions to all the candidates. I think four of the six uh, answered there, but it's pretty useful information uh, to riff uh, from, not least of uh, which uh, Joe Jorgensen apparently has a pretty serious Axel Rose problem uh, here that uh, I think we're going to spend most of the second half of the debate uh, talking about. Okay, we're going to go into... Yes, please. Nope, you can't. That's so. Ah, there we go. Yes. Yeah, I have, I have a rebuttal for you, Matt, yes, actually. You, you shouldn't be asking a bunch of libertarians who our favorite Democrats and Republicans are. You should be asking Republicans and Democrats who their favorite libertarians are. And, so and we I really need to turn that mentality around. And I will say for all the great candidates on this stage, Echoing what Dan Fishman said, you see how the old parties get behind their candidates now? We need to build that culture. That's why I've been running for uh, for almost two years now, so that we could build the organization, build the momentum, and have things in place. Let's step up our game and flip the script on them. Adam, if I didn't ask that question, I wouldn't give you a golden opportunity to rebuke the moderator and look better in the eyes of the audience. So. <laughs> Allow the set of the volleyball on occasion. Okay, um, so we're going to talk uh, more on personal uh, uh, things in this second half here. Uh, first of all, everyone, uh, their Axel Rose uh, story. Uh, but beyond that, um, actually, I need to hit the randomizer here. Sorry, again. And uh, Ken Armstrong is going to go first, which is uh, which is cool. Uh, I want to hear from each of you an honest answer to the best of your uh, ability. Um, what single bit of the Libertarian Party platform do you either disagree with the most or just sort of makes you most uncomfortable as you agree with it? Ken Armstrong. Oh, and I have to be honest this time? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know he was going to throw that one in on us. It's the um, second half. It's the whiskey part. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'm actually very comfortable with the platform. The difficulty comes in selling it to people who don't understand what we're about. And that takes a little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, a little bit of honest conversation. When we talk about things like uh, decriminalizing sex trades, you know, it's not because we want to dehumanize women, it's because the government has never done a good job of controlling things like that. So I, I, while I'm, I'm very, very comfortable with the platform, Sometimes we need to do some very personal one-on-one -on -one to sell it. Berman Supreme, is there any part of the Libertarian Party platform that you don't agree with or makes you feel uncomfortable? Not that I will admit to. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent answer. Adam Kokesh? Except the part about debate moderators, do you agree with everything in the Libertarian Party platform? <laughs> I love the party platform, especially the statement of principles. And I love seeing our secretary, Karen Ann Harlow, is going out as the big history buff in the Libertarian Party, preserving documents and getting that out there and understanding why we are so committed and what makes us the party of principle going back to the first national convention when we came up with this idea of having something that is so built in, protected by the seven-eighths rule within the Libertarian Party platform at, with the statement of principles. It is, we, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. I've heard it read at state party gatherings like it's straight out of the Bible. It is beautiful. Now, there's one thing 
that I think is a critical shift in how we present it. I will say there's one thing I'd like to add, and that's localization. I know it's covered in different ways, but that we get government down to the voluntary community level with the everybody gets what they want strategy. We can communicate this message that much more powerfully and reach that many more people. Very good. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, any part of the platform you're uncomfortable with? I'd really like to see taxation and theft sprinkled around a few more times. <laughs> um, there's, I, I think it's chapter four, section 17, where there's a, a missing Oxford comma. Um, I, no, I really think the, the platform is really great. I think most of it's designed around the, the basic idea of the non-aggression principle of self-ownership and self-responsibility. And the idea that we don't need government to micromanage our lives, there's no way they can. There's no way that a few hundred or a few thousand or however many politicians we have at whatever, whatever level of government, there's no way that they know us individually well enough to know what's right for us. And I think that's pretty well laid out in every single platform that's in there. Kim Ruff, platform. Yeah, it's funny. I, I don't disagree with any aspect of the platform. In fact, the platform is precisely why I changed my voter registration in 2005 to become a libertarian, because it was such a beautiful articulation of our values and beliefs, starting with, of course, the statement of principles. So with that in mind, what I'd like to talk about instead is some of the interesting questions I get asked running as a presidential candidate, which speaks more to how little people seem to understand what the actual role and function of the president is. I get asked about all sorts of things that are oftentimes I have to say, well, that's a, that's a state powers or thing. That's not something that the president has any impact on. Or, you know, what are you going to do about this issue? And well, that's the legislature. I'm not running for the legislature. I'm running only for president, which is the executive branch. It's the enforcement arm of the state. I don't make laws. I can act as a functional bully pulpit. But above and beyond that, I have a very limited purview, as we should all have. So that's probably what I would disagree with, is just how some of those ideas actually translate into that role. And Joe Jorgensen. Yes, I agree with the platform. And I've actually never registered or voted Democrat or Republican in the 40 years that I've been voting. In fact, when I moved to a state that I knew I was going to be there temporarily, I actually went through the trouble to get my voter registration card just so I could vote for Ron Paul, even though I was going to be leaving in a few months. So yes, I love the platform. That's why I'm part of the party. The only one that I would question is um, Harry Brown and Ron Paul did disagree with the abortion issue. And while they did a very good job of supporting the platform, uh, I, I wonder if maybe it would keep some people out uh, as far as who would say, yes, that's part of the right to life. And I'm not saying that, that the platform should become pro-life, but perhaps not have it there just so that uh, it doesn't keep some people from even considering us because we need to grow the party. And we need to grow the party with people who want life, liberty, and property. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so this next question is, um, which will be uh, answered first appropriately, perhaps, by Vermin Supreme, um, is probably the single uh, most common question uh, brought to me on Twitter when I asked solicited questions. And this is uh, both of libertarians and non-libertarians alike. Um, and the question is prefaced by the Libertarian Party has a problem, in the view of a lot of these people asking this, these questions, uh, with not being taken seriously James Weeks, the strip tease in 2016, which is one of three things apparently a lot of people only remember from the 2016 campaign. Um, and here is Vermin Supreme showing up wearing a boot. That doesn't feel very serious. That's, that's actually detracting from the party's seriousness of message. Or maybe it's Dan, taxation is theft. Berman changing his name to taxation is theft and wearing a big yellow floppy hat or whatever, fill in the blank. As someone who does put on the boot uh, and talk about ponies, how do you respond to that question that I get asked all the damn time? Thank you very much. That is one of the main concerns that I feel that I'm often confronted with. Uh, people ask me, they wonder, can a serious political party put up a perceived joke candidate and not be considered a joke party? I say yes. I believe it is absolutely in the framing. I believe the Libertarian Party could very easily put out a flat out statement to put themselves ahead of the joke, simply saying, yes, we are the Libertarian Party. We are a party of ideals. We are a party of action. We are a party of, of things. And uh, however, and then the pivot, 
the electoral system in America, the duopoly, the presidential elections have risen to the level of a joke. And here's Vermin Supreme with love and spite. Enjoy. And I, I believe that the Libertarian Party could get ahead of, the, of that. And if they were in on the joke and they were made it very clear that they are putting up Vermin Supreme as a joke, as a critique, and then let nature do its rest. Joe Jorgensen, does the Libertarian Party have a perceived seriousness issue and do boots on heads and jokes help or hurt? Well, I'm not sure why you're asking me. I've never worn a boot on my head. <laughs> no, and, but uh, you're a member and, of the Libertarian Party, and this is a common, uh, it's never too late to start. <laughs> never too late. Good point, good point. And uh, while Just I did right. legally change my name, it was not that. <laughs> uh, actually, I do have a concern overall about about how people treat us. However, I, and I don't... Yes, I guess in a way I do. Uh, I, I, here's the thing. We're all going to have to get together at the convention, and somebody's going to be the nominee, and we need to all support each other. So I'm not going to sit here and say somebody shouldn't wear a boot on his head. However, I think we do need to present ourselves as presidential, and I think we're all standing here dressed very presidentially, and I think if we were on a televised debate, I think we would actually look um, not as a joke party. Kim Ruff. Well, I think that we are not taken seriously, not because of who we have in front of the camera, but because generally speaking, mainstream media and the duopoly, so Republicans and Democrats, are not going to want us in front of the camera. So they're gonna find any perceived flaw and blow it out of proportion. Doesn't matter if you wear a boot on your head or two on your feet, they're still gonna find something to nitpick because that's what they choose to do with us. However, if we are unified in our messaging, because it is all sales, if we're unified in our messaging, we are clear about what it is to be a libertarian, then we can get this information out there. Some people are gonna respond positively to Vermin's show, and they do. People respond positively to Adam. They may not necessarily be the people who like how I say it or how I present it, but they're still libertarians and they're still listening. Every foot in the door, every tactic is invaluable in this fight. As long as we are consistent in our message and we are on point about what it means to be a libertarian. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman. Can anyone in this room name more than two Republican candidates who are running, or more than, let's just say, 20 Democrat candidates that are running. <laughs> there are over 700 candidates, and that was an article that was put out months ago, who knows how many now, that are running for the presidency. Many of them are Democrats and Republicans, and many of them have much bigger issues than what they wear on their head. The reason you don't hear from them is because the media controls what we see. And look what won. Look what's in the White House right now. That started out as a joke. Everyone thought that was a joke. Nobody thought he was going to win. Everybody laughed at him. He's crazy. And what happened? Now, I'll give you, he's a little bit different. He bankrolled himself. He's a billionaire. He's made lots of money ripping people off. We don't have that. OK. But is a hat really going to make that much of a difference when we have such a big issue with the media controlling what we see? Shouldn't we focus our attention there and ask why? They're not giving attention to any of the other candidates, whether they're libertarians, green, or independent. Why? Ken Armstrong. Well, I, I think our problem is not so much uh, the, whether we're theatrical or not theatrical. Uh, we've got six, I think, just fabulous people on the stage today, and I think we all make each other better. I think there is a perception issue that's created by the media, and, and, uh, and I think it's a real thing. And I agree with what Vermin says, that we need to, we need to explain ourselves a little bit better uh, and, and help the public to understand uh, what's going on, but I do think that we need to to identify what our brand is 
and, and stick to the brand. And that doesn't mean that we all have to wear a dark blue suit and a, and a gold tie. And it, it certainly doesn't mean that we all have to look like Shrek or sound like Darth Vader or any of those things. But it does mean that when we're out there before the public, that we're representing the libertarian brand and not ourselves. The after uh, party is going to be competing Axl Rose and Darth Vader impersonations, apparently. Uh, Adam Kokesh, uh, take us home on this question. Does the Libertarian Party have an image issue? Do you watch too much mainstream media? I no, I actually <laughs> do almost watch none of it. I just participate in it. There's a difference. Whoever is the Libertarian Party nominee in 2020 is going to be running against the world's greatest troll doll. Hair included. You think we have an image problem? No, 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 no. Let's put this in perspective. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then... That's where we are as a party right now. Let's embrace that, be libertarian, stand up for who we are, be the best libertarians we can be, because this is a message that reaches to the heart of every single American. That's the image we should have as the best libertarians that we can be. Thank you, Adam. Stay standing, Adam Kokesh, because you are first in the uh, next round, which is uh, each question is going to be uh, personalized to the person uh, uh, answering it, and so it's not going to be generalized. So question to you, Adam Kokesh. Uh, controversially, at least among the 13 people, um, you recently went to a, or participated in some way in a straight pride uh, uh, event or parade. Um, uh, can you explain why you did that? Uh, and also, is that the type of thing that you uh, uh, plan on doing in your campaign and as the nominee? Well, Matt, I think in order to present this honestly, you have to say that I went to the straight pride march and to the protest against the straight pride march and Thank spoke you for at both and originally went to the straight pride march in order to punk it basically and had a lot of fun doing so because frankly the culture war is divisive bullshit it is really sick and sad you're gonna fight over culture because other people want to live differently. Some, this is the problem with government under a centralized coercive authority. Liberals and conservatives have to meet on the street and see each other as enemies because they have to fight over who's going to get their will forced on the other through this one size fits nobody but the profiteer solution. And that's what drives divisiveness. That's what creates polarization. And it, it was a little bit of a tough situation there, Matt, to say, I'm going to piss off both audiences I'm speaking today and say you're all wrong for participating in this and America's united in saying this nonsense needs to stop. We should unite around freedom. Kim Ruff, uh, in your uh, South Carolina LP interview page, I think you were asked something along the lines of um, what are the biggest challenges facing the country? And you had a very interesting answer, which is, I don't think the government really is facing significant challenges right now. That's interesting. Can you explain that a little bit? Because that's not the thing that a lot of people would perceive. Would you mind reading me what I wrote again? Uh, <laughs> I write a lot of things. <laughs> uh, give me one moment here. What is the biggest, that's pretty quick, right? 10 seconds of being called out on the, what is the biggest challenge facing the federal government currently? Kim Ruff was asked as she's filibustering for her answer. Uh, I would argue that the federal government isn't currently facing any significant challenges, which has led us to the very situation we're in and fighting against blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. So what I was driving at when I wrote that answer, which is a lot longer than what Matt did, uh, was basically saying that we aren't challenging our federal government enough. That is what's going on. We are in a situation where we are basically on cruise control as an electorate. And we, you notice, like statistically speaking, even though your city council has way more bearing on your day-to-day -day functions, more people participate in presidential elections. But even so, in 2016, 46% of the eligible voting population chose to sit on the sidelines and instead permit government to do what thou wilt. 
And that's the problem, is that we aren't rising up. We aren't paying attention anymore. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that most of us are so taxed, so burdened financially because of the fact that we have to support this Leviathan, that we are too tired to pay attention to what's going on. We're not active, we're not involved, we don't pay attention and we don't push back. But we have the capability. It starts with every single one of us. It's incumbent upon each of us to say, I have the power and I demand it back. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, it's right there in your middle name. But do you mean it for corporate taxes, bro? <laughs> All right, so I, I know this is going back to a Twitter post um, where I said that a corporate tax is slightly more legitimate than a tax on the individual. And the reason I say that is because a corporation is a business and it's free to do business however it wants. It started with just a bunch of people, maybe a bunch of people in a garage saying, hey, we're gonna create a business, we're gonna do something, we're gonna trade a product and a service for money. But they went to the government and they said, oh, government, wonderful government, please give us protection. Give us protection against other companies that are com gonna compete with us. Create licensing laws. Protect us from, uh, from liability. So if somebody sues us, we don't have to pay. We already took our money out. They can just take the company, but they can't touch us. They've created these corporations as a special protection from government. And it's really more like you're buying something. So yeah, let them pay. They agreed to it in the first place. Your cell phone bill is not a tax because you went to the cell phone company and said, hey, I want this service, here's some money. How much is it gonna cost me? So why shouldn't a corporation have to pay taxes? Now I will say this, the government should not have those powers for sale. Corporations should not be able to buy this power in the first place. Thank you, Dan. Vermin Supreme. If I have this correctly, you have run for political office, not just in the Libertarian Party, but also the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Yes. Are there any other parties that you wish to uh, confess to running for here? Uh, no, those are the two. Okay. Um, so the question is, how are you any different than Lincoln Chafee? Well, once again, of course, uh, I would maintain that every one of my previous campaigns was simply not a real campaign. It was a parody campaign. It was a goof campaign. When I ran as a Republican, I was not a Republican. When I ran as a Democrat, I was not a Democrat. I'm currently running for the Libertarian Party nomination, and I am a Libertarian. That is a very huge difference right there. Um, I have a real campaign with a real campaign staff. We are raising real campaign money, taking part in real debates. Um, I believe that I'm very well equipped to lead the Libertarian Party uh, into the land of 5%, into growing the party, into using my uh, viral celebrity to really make an impact and impart uh, libertarian ideals out to audiences that we've had a very hard, difficult time uh, reaching uh, through, uh, through all the various viral medias that I've had by harnessing the uh, current uh, groups of kids. I mean, the kids in our amazing demographic, um, and I hope to harness them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe Jorgensen, I recommend everyone here go and look at her speech at the 1996 Libertarian Party convention. Um, it's the uh, what the kind of structuring joke is about one nine hundred sex telephone numbers, um, and also uh, talking about how hey you know uh, we we should be welcoming to Steve's For Steve Forbes Republicans, um, which is a way of saying. That was a long time ago. <laughs> well, what have you been doing since 1996 for the cause of freedom in the Libertarian Party? Preparing for this campaign, for one thing. Indirectly, I've, uh, I've earned, what, three college degrees and a graduate certificate. I've gotten my life in order to where I can uh, spend time on the road and not worry about uh, working five days a week at home. So I've got the time and the money and the effort to be able to put into it. Very good. Ken Armstrong, uh, you commanded like a NATO mission or a very uh, elaborate career for someone in a party where most people want to dissolve NATO. Are you really ready to dissolve NATO or what do you think NATO should, what should be done with the system of alliances that we have right now? Well, NATO's a treaty and, and I believe in treaties and contracts between willing participants. I'm just not sure that the American people really know what they bought into with NATO. 
And uh, yeah, I, I, honestly, I think that we need to back away from NATO. The only reason I believe we should stay in the United Nations, to tell you the truth, is because being a permanent member of the Security Council, we get that precious veto on the Security Council, and I don't think we want to give that up. But I, these, these global organizations are not globalist, they're corporatist. And I think we need to, to get as far away from them as we can. Very good. We'll go back to a general uh, round of questioning here, talking about uh, the 2016 Libertarian Party uh, presidential um, uh, experience. Um, in any way, shape you want to put it, what is a lesson, Kim Ruff, you will start here, what is a lesson from 2016 um, that you think is relevant to be thinking about as we approach 2020? Well, I, a lesson from that, Lisa, to run. I'm going to set it down and uh, get to dance. Okay. Sorry. All right. The big takeaway and the lesson for me, at least, on 2016 is that we should not allow ourselves to be bullied. We should not be allow ourselves to be put in a position where we're effectively told that if we don't elect a certain person or nominate a certain person to represent us, then we're going to have the whole thing fall apart. We shouldn't buy into lies because that's what we were fed, and we should stand up and have a fearless libertarian as our standard bearer. On the state and local level, I know how hard you guys work. Most of us here know how hard you guys work because we do the same thing too. We scramble every election cycle to get ballot access, to ensure our candidates get representation. We're shunned by mainstream media, it's difficult to get the money, and we sweat blood and tears. We do this every single time. And it's important that our presidential candidate represents us fearlessly because that is what builds our moment and keeps us going. Adam Kokesh, lesson from 2016. All right, all right, now we're live. Start the clock. All right. So uh, in 2016, we nominated someone who was running in 2012. We gave him the mantle of being the Libertarian Party nominee for president. And he could have spent the time in between using that to build the party. And instead, he went and rode bicycles and climbed mountains. Good for him. The biggest lesson I see there is that if we're going to nominate someone, we got to recognize that what we're giving them is incredibly valuable. And it has to be someone who we can trust with that, who's gonna use it to maximum impact, whose commitment to the cause is unquestionable, who's been in it for the long haul, who has the endurance, who has the commitment to the cause to take advantage of that. And the other thing in 2016 in, in that race is that we need a different message. We need a fundamental shift from playing their game making this about politics. It's not. Freedom is about love and ethics and unity and basic moral principles that unite us as a human family. When we put that forward, that's how we're going to win, not by playing their game. Ken Armstrong, lessons from the 2016 Libertarian Party race. Well, I'm going to jump back to the 1860 race. You all remember that. You were there, right? Uh, you know, the Republican Party was six years old at the time. And they nominated a guy who'd held office in Congress one term and lost his reelection and been out of office for a decade, Abraham Lincoln. And so they didn't pick a guy with a great reputation, great name recognition, or any of that sort of thing. But when they nominated him, they got behind him. They put energy behind him, and he swept them into power. And the biggest problem that we have is that we're a house of cats, all wanting to go do our own thing. We need to get behind whoever this party nominates for the 2020 election. Joe Jorgensen, lessons from 2016. Yes, Gary Johnson was definitely a libertarian. He's always acted as a libertarian. He was a libertarian in office. The one thing is, though, that people join the Libertarian Party for different reasons. And Gary Johnson had, met, had mentioned at the 2016 convention to a handful of libertarians that he had never read a libertarian book. And the problem with that is 
one person might come to the Libertarian Party for a different reason than somebody else. So it's not good enough to know why you came to the party or what works for you. In fact, when I ran for uh, Congress in 1992 and I gave people my reasons why I joined the party, I was shocked that they didn't agree with me. So over the past few months, I've reread Losing Ground by Charles Murray, Free to Choose by Milton Friedman, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, Why Government Doesn't Work by Harry Brown, Secrets of Libertarian Persuasion by Michael Cloud and Libertarianism in One Lesson by David Berglund so that I can learn all the reasons to persuade everybody to join regardless of the reason they want to join and want liberty and freedom. Berman Supreme, Lessons from 2016. I learned that the uh, respectability politics are dead and that no matter what suit you put up, uh, the mainstream media will completely ignore that and I believe that it's time to try something uh, radically different. I'm just thinking, I believe it's time to put something forward that, uh, that they can't possibly ignore, something that they're going to have a hard time to wrap their head around. I think we're talking about putting up a, a performance artist, a clown, a character, and saying this is what we believe about your ridiculous system. We believe about the, the mandatory toothbrushing law in any state. We believe the, the free ponies giveaways and other such magical things. And uh, the opportunity to allow something so different that it cannot be ignored, that it will sweep the nation, that it will become a, a tsunami of excitement amongst the younger generation. Um, this, this is what I learned. I, I learned that, uh, that what we're doing um, up to that point, up to this point, just a, a suit ain't going to make it. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, lessons from 2016. I think the most important message is go bold or go home. We have to be big and loud and out there with this message, and that's one of the reasons I wear the big yellow hat. And it works really well. And with this message, before we have... We've, we've had with past candidates trying to explain what a libertarian is. Meanwhile, the Democrats and Republicans are out there saying, this is what we're going to give you. We're the odd man out. Why even consider us? They're not giving us anything. You can't tell them we're going to give you freedom because all they want is free stuff. But with our campaign, we've been working on our messaging and we've been able to get lots of Democrats, hardcore Bernie Sanders supporters and Republicans, ex-Trump supporters to support our campaign. They're not full libertarians yet but they're on their way because they get it, because we've been able to tell them this is what we're gonna do for you that gets you out of this fear mindset that the other par parties and politicians are putting you in to control you, and they get it. In just two minutes, one of my supporters, a 14-year-old kid, convinced a conservative that we should legalize heroin. <laughs> that's, how, what, that's what you can do with messaging. It's amazing. Thank you, Dan. We'll go to another round here. This one's going to be started by Joe Jorgensen. Um, so we were just talking about the Johnson uh, Weld campaign, or at least referring to it. They raised, what, $12 million, got four, two. 12 points, not that anyone's <laughs> counting, uh, got almost four and a half million votes. Um, the Libertarian Party, there's going to be 1,000 people deciding the nomination. There are something like 15,000 sustaining or regular uh, uh, members uh, giving money. You're going to have to appeal to people outside of the party, and you're going to have to raise money. So specifically on the money part, um, do you anticipate being able to raise $12.2 million? $12 million uh, and if so, how? Well, you spoiled my thunder there since I had the numbers. But yes, if we look at the votes, basically the more money we raise, the more votes we get. Bob Barr raised $1.4 million and we got uh, 500,000 votes. So the challenge for everybody up here on stage, each of us, is to be able to raise enough money. Now, Gary Johnson had only raised $1 million, I say only, but uh, close to $1 million by the convention. And my campaign organizer has raised $14 million in his lifetime for libertarian causes. And he feels very confident that he can get to the $1 million mark and perhaps even surpass Gary Johnson's first time out between now and the convention. Vermin Supreme, aside from getting me to pay for the tie of yours that I stole, um, how do you plan? Yes. How do you plan on? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. True, true story. How do you uh, yes. how do you plan? Do you plan on getting to twelve million? And if so, how? 
Well, that's a pretty inconceivable amount of money. It's a whole lot of money. It's, it's money I can't even begin to imagine. So I would say, yeah, sure, of course I'm going to. We're, we're going to get fundraisers, and, and we're, we're going to crowdsource it, and we're going to get like uh, 12 million people to send me a dollar. So that's, that's going to happen. That, that's a no-brainer. We're going to make that quick. Um, so yeah, definitely. I'm going to spend it, too. <laughs> And, and we're going to get a bigger bang for the buck because I'm going to get a lot of free media, a lot of, a lot of thousands and millions of dollars worth of free media is going to be happening. And uh, we're going to run a mean and lean campaign. And we're not going to need the kind of like consultants and specialists and some of these other ridiculous things that a lot of these campaigns are pissing away millions of dollars on in the presidential real world. I mean, yeah, we'll price out polls. We'll see what we have to do. But we're going to run a mean, lean campaign. We're going to hit the ground running. We're going to have, uh, once we receive the nomination, we all have exactly six months to ramp it up through the roof, and I and my team are getting ready to do just that. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman. Uh, can we just print it? That's, <laughs> is, uh, um, so there's a lot of interesting um, story around this, and you know we have to look at a lot. We have to look at um, you know, what was the environment in 2016? We had plenty of libertarians who were in the party who were convinced that we were going to win just because we had the one candidate that everybody didn't hate. And this is, this is a huge motivating factor, but it's only going to get us so far. And I think one thing that we need to do is we need to show that our message actually works and how people are responding to it and how it's actually changing things. And that is going to get what's that's what's going to get people to open up and give us more money and see what's happening. And we can do a lot more with volunteers than we can with money because we already know how the mainstream media is going to treat us. Present company excluded. Um, is that my mainstream? I don't know. <laughs> it's unclear. Um, so yeah, I think I think it is realistic to raise that amount of money, but we need to do things a little bit differently, and we need to try new things that haven't been done before. Adam Kokesh, as the leader preliminarily in the fundraising race on this stage, uh, can you get to $12 million? To raise money for mics. <laughs> Streaming. We good here? All right. I think using the benchmark from last year should be seen as a, a launch pad, not a target. You know, we should be seeking to get way above and beyond that. And uh, with our campaign, it's, it's, uh, it's almost sad to say we've raised just over $200,000. I've put about 140 of that in myself and about 60 from individual donors. And until recently, that was uh, 10 times the rest of the libertarian field. And that doesn't make any of us competitive with the mainstream. I close deals. I make sales. We need to make this happen. So I'm going to ask everybody here, because I'm not afraid to ask for help. We need money. Give to one of these campaigns at the end of this debate. Decide who you want to support. Give to at least one of us. And if you can't, help us. Sign up as a volunteer. Be a part of this. I know with this message from what I've seen that we can do this with everybody in America. We can bring people in. We can raise money from demographics that the Libertarian Party has never touched before because localization is the everybody gets what they want strategy. And more than anything else on the campaign trail, what I hear, and this is so important to reach the traditional non-voters, the 40% who don't even vote in, in presidential elections, what I hear more than anything else is, I don't normally vote, but I'd come out and vote for that. Ken Armstrong. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've spent the last six months out on the road finding out a lot of things about the American people. And, and one of the things that, that Dawn and I have discovered is how tired they are of this horrible uh, game of dog-eat-dog -dog that's going on. I think we, we need to uh, articulate ourselves well. But I do believe that, that the money follows the message, not the other way around. And I think if we can get really smart in, in how we propagate that message out to the public, um, there, you know, we do need to use fundraising professionals. We do need to have the kind of events that, that raise money. But we need to get very, very smart on how we get that message out as a party when we have a nominee to carry the banner. Thank you. And Kim Ruff, $12.2 million. Can you get there? How you get there? 
<laughs> well, I'm actually very much the same mind as Vermin with respect to that. I mean, first of all, I can't accurately predict what I'm going to get. And I'm not going to say I'm going to get 12 point whatever million dollars. But if you do have one person, 12 million people give you a dollar, that ultimately adds up. Mostly, what I want to focus on here is what we've done thus far on a shoestring budget and how much we can achieve. Because I don't buy the argument that $12. million is going to yield a stupid amount of votes. Because you forget all the other factors that went into 2016 or 2012 or any other year. Money is part of it, but it's not the sum total of its parts. It also comes down to candidates and the infrastructure that they've built. We have a team right now that consists of well over 200 people. We have individuals stacked at the state level who have their own teams that they manage. And every single person from me down does this gratis. Not a single person here is getting a dime. We do it because we care. And we're able to achieve because of our sheer force of will. So I don't think money is necessarily the issue, but it will follow. Very good. I think what we'll do here is have one last round of questioning. And in order to get rid of the awful bottleneck that is me, uh, allow the candidates to question one another if they so choose. Um, and then after that, we'll go to closing uh, statements. So I'm going to throw it open to the field, uh, starting with Vermin Supreme. You can ask any one of your fellow candidates, or maybe someone in the audience, or me, or camera, or the flag, uh, a question. And they will have uh, 30 seconds to respond. Any question, field is yours. Ken, what about the Dallas Accord? What about the Dallas Accord? Exactly. Um, what is Aleppo? Uh, <laughs> um, it, you, you, you got me. Um, I'm, I'm, Joe, I'm, what about the Dallas Accord? I, you only got one. Oh, sorry. sorry. That's it. Uh, <laughs> next question, Ken. You have a question. You can get it back if you want. Uh, no, I'm not going to hit back. Uh, Adam, please tell me what legal basis you would use for dissolving the government and for establishing the guardians of the government. I'm so glad that I don't have a microphone that works. Uh, all right. We'll do this one again. I'm so glad you asked, Ken, because... A lot of times I get asked the question, is your platform constitutional? And the answer is, heck no, it's not constitutional. That's kind of the point. We are appealing to the higher authority known as the Declaration of Independence, which says we have not only a right, but a duty to alter and abolish systems of government that no longer serve us. He could take a bit more time. It's All right. Been central to his other thing. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, but hurry. Various people have thrown up various legal challenges to this platform. But the reason we're doing it this way, turning the presidential election into a referendum on whether or not the federal government should exist, should be allowed to continue to exist, is that when the American people decisively say, we're going to put our foot down, we're not going to put up with this crap anymore. Nobody in a suit in Washington, D. is going to stand in our way. And if you say that I can't do this, what you're really saying is that the American people can't do this, and I disagree. Kim Ruff, ask a question. And we can do 60 seconds on the answers uh, instead of 30. I think it's better. Ask a question. OK. Uh, my question is actually for Vermin, but it's not intended to be combative at all. It's really more just to give you a springboard to talk about it. So I told you that I'd listened to that podcast, Cults, that had talked about the Church of Euthanasia. And they were talking about the whole experience with Chris Corda and how it found it. And to be clear, the Church of Euthanasia was not a cult, OK? It happened to be on this podcast, but I want to make sure that's clear. One of the things that happened was when you guys went on Jerry Springer, it was like you, Chris Corda, and another founding member, you guys were a little bit disparate in how you presented the point and purpose of it. I understand the point and purpose, but I was just wondering, since one of the things we struggle with as libertarians is presenting a unified message, how, how are we going to, as a team, all be able to combat that, ensure that we do present a unified message, and how are you part of that solution? 
Thank you for that question. Uh, the COE was, of course, uh, an agile prop performance art group that I was involved with in the uh, in 1997, uh, long before I had considered any sort of a, a real campaign. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty outrageous. It was pretty over the top, and it was definitely all about shock and in your face. And the imagery was was really frightening. Um, that being said, um, how can we as liberta libertarians present a United front, um, I suppose that's uh, fairly difficult given the, the vast amount of personalities involved. Uh, um, but other than sticking to the talking points and, and focusing on the Libertarian Party platform, which uh, is uh, a thing that I have pledged to do in my campaign, um, because that is indeed the heart and soul of the Libertarian Party. What is a party but the sum of its platform? Um, so I, I think as long as we can all stay on topic and make that the, the topic of conversation, make sure that's where we're at. Uh, then we will uh, appear as unified as we can be under the circumstances, given all the, the very varieties of libertarians there are. Thank you, Vermin. Adam Kokesh, question for any of your competitors. Thank you. Do I? Oh, again? All right. <laughs> Sex work is work. And interfering with consensual relationships between adults is criminal. The libertarian position here on respect for freedom and freedom of association is very clear. Joe, you were asked this question earlier today and sidestepped it, and I certainly appreciate your angle on messaging, but shouldn't we have someone who can represent the message of freedom unabashedly, directly, and answer a straightforward question like that? Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I must admit, when somebody asked me the question, I should have gotten more information because I actually didn't see that CNN thing with Gary uh, Johnson. And I might have made an incorrect assumption, I don't know, because I didn't see it. Here's the point I was trying to make. Whenever I see a debate or questions being asked, from the news media. It's usually, okay, Mr. Democratic candidate, what do you think about foreign policy? What, we, what should we do with free trade? And then they ask the Republican, uh, tell me, what about the military overseas? When should we bring them back? What about the budget deficits? And then the Libertarian, what about sex work? And what my point was is that we need to be treated with the same respect as Democrats and Republicans. Now, if they're asking Democrats and Republicans the same question, absolutely. Uh, but my answer would be, and I would like to use Ed Clark's, uh, the, the way Ed Clark answered a question like that, and I wasn't clear on this, is if somebody asked Ed Clark, well, what do you think about this? And it was a question that nobody but a libertarian would answer. Uh, for instance, well, he would say, for instance, yes, I agree with that, but this is what the voters are suggesting. So my answer would be, my, my answer would be, yes, I would, uh, I would immediately first day, my, my answer to the question is my first day in office, I would release everybody from prison who's in there for a nonviolent uh, sex act, and now let's talk about what the voters are asking me. And, uh, put us on the same level of seriousness as a Democrat and Republican candidate. Joe Jorgensen, keep that mic. Uh, ask a question of someone uh, here. Sure, uh, Ken. We're all libertarians here running for office, and I would just like to know, please define what is a libertarian? A libertarian is a person who believes that they have more right than anyone else to determine the course of their lives. A libertarian is a person who believes that the less government we have to interfere with our lives, the better off we are. To be honest, you did a lot better that than I do when people do that to me. Um, Dan, taxation is theft. Berman, let's finish this round. Ask a question to any of your co-runners for president. There's only one question on my mind, and so I, I know most of the candidates' answers, so I have to ask. Um, let's go with Ken. Is taxation theft, and what would you do about the income tax and the IRS? Okay. This is a thorny one, but I'm, I'm wearing my, uh, my porcupine today, so I can do that. As, as a legal matter, taxation is not theft. 
by, by legal definition. By moral definition, absolutely it's theft. And even more important than that, the income tax itself is stupid. It's a regressive penalty for productivity. The worst way to grow an economy is to penalize the people for productivity. So if we're going to have any kind of tax at all, it should be a voluntary tax based on consumption, not on, on uh, a, an involuntary tax based on productivity. All right, thus ends the question period of the debate. We're going to go to closing statements, which well, the candidates have 90 seconds, as they did, um, and we will go in the reverse order that we did the opening. So from Ken Armstrong on down. It has been my pleasure for the last six months, and I will say that a lot of times pleasure comes with quite a bit of pain, but it has been my pleasure for the last six months to travel 40 states so far around the country and to get to know American people in a way that I never had before. Um, and, and really, I mean, uh, met with David Thoreau at the Independent Institute in California, had dinner with Larry Sharp in New York, and, and those were wonderful experiences. But even more important than that were, were the ordinary everyday Americans, the homeless people, the, the, the waitresses, the, the, uh, the hotel staff, the, the people that we met on the street, and, and just finding out how, honestly, you know, we say something all of the time, but Dawn and I have been discovering that this is absolutely true. If people know what we're about, they discover that they've always been libertarians. It took me until almost 25 years ago to discover that I was a libertarian. And it, when, when we explain what we're really about, people get it. And it's my passion as I travel around the country to have that conversation with people. Thank you, Ken. Vermin Supreme. Thank you, my boot is a boot, it's a magic boot, it stands for all that is good in America and the rights that the Libertarian Party stands for, the ability to wear a boot on your head if you so want to because it harms no one at all. Um, 3.9 million high school students graduate in any given year. Give me two of those years, that's 8 million kids. Add that to the 17 million college students in college any given year, that's a pool of 25 million uh, people, uh, give me one out of four of those voters, that will equal your 5% right there. That does, does not include the millions and millions of disenfranchised, disillusioned, disgusted uh, individuals who could be voting but aren't voting. I think we could give them a very clear-cut choice. Um, uh, putting up a man with a boot on his head will certainly uh, show and uh, demonstrate the contempt that is worthy of the duopoly and their presidential charade. Um, the opportunities are limitless. This May in Austin, the Libertarian Party will be given a very, very clear choice. They will choose of two time streams. There will be one time stream available that the LP can choose where Vermin Supreme is the nominee and we take back America from whoever has it, whenever we take it back from them. Or something else. The choice will be yours choose wisely together we will ride our ponies into a zombie powered future thank you joe jorgensen closing remarks as the presidential nominee i will double the size of the libertarian party membership how do you know i can do that because i did it before with harry brown in 1996 we more than doubled the national party size from 10,000 members to over 22,800. But we didn't do it alone. We did it by teaming up with the national leadership. Uh, we teamed up with national chair, Steve Dasbach. In fact, Steve's here, can you say hi? We teamed up with Bill Winter, communication director, Perry Willis, educate, uh, uh, Perry Willis. And uh, last but not least, we paired up with Michael Cloud, the fundraiser for Harry Brown. Can you say hello? So as the presidential nominee, what I would do is I would work with the Libertarian Party closely to make sure that everybody we came in contact would be sent to the National Libertarian Party and double the size of the Libertarian Party. Big government is the problem. Small government is a solution. Vote Dr. Joe Jorgensen, the small government candidate. 
Adam Kokesh. Before we start the clock, can we... Uh, uh. All right, we got one. All right, let's do this. Are you fed up with the two-party system? Can we do better than this, America? Are you ready to live up to the ideals of the American Revolution? Government keeps us divided, fighting over power in a centralized system driven by hate. I'm fed up with cadet bone spurs our narcissist in chief. But the culture of hate politics goes well beyond Orange Julius. Yes, Trump, you are driven by so much statist hatred, and this is the Lovolution. Just as light drives out dark and love drives out hate, you will lose and love will win. America, we are too good for this government. We don't have to be forced into one system to be united in American values. Localization is the cure for polarization. With voluntary community level government, you can live in harmony with systems that represent your values and meet your needs. With localization, we unite every single American around that which makes us America. A revolution with every generation. To get better microphones. <laughs> yes, all right. I'll be done in a few seconds. All right. <laughs> we are called upon now by fate and fortune to have the best revolution ever. A revolution of love and peace and freedom, a way of harmony. This is the revolution you've been waiting for. Thank you very much. Dan, taxation is theft. Berman. So first, I, I want to apologize. I hope I didn't insult you by saying mainstream. But oh, it's a pretty legitimate organization. Dude, I'm old. Not, not <laughs> uh, so one thing that I think is really important to recognize is the government that we have, as big as it is, as much as everybody hates it, especially when their party's not in charge, that government is a government that we have that people wanted. You have one party who says, oh yeah, I want the government to get bigger as long as my guy's in charge. And then a few years later, everybody else says, well, those people did all those things to me. We need my guy in charge to make the government even bigger to reverse all the damage that was done. The only way we're going to get off of this train wreck is if we change that conversation and change that direction. And it doesn't come from pointing out all the flaws in the system and saying, this is bad and those guys are bad and those guys are bad. It comes from us being able to explain the benefits, how much better your life is gonna be without maybe just this one government organization or this government organization. And something we have to realize about the candidates that we have up on this stage, everybody's different. Government tries to be one size fits all. Every single one of us appeals to a different audience. We're bringing people together with this message that less government is better. And we're working together to make that happen. But in order to win, the first thing that has to change is the minds of the people. And Kim Ruff, take us home. Well, just to reiterate, in case it hasn't become abundantly clear, my name is Kim Ruff, and that is indeed my legitimate last name. It's true. I am normally hesitant to talk about personal things, but I feel it's incumbent upon me to tell you this. The prime mover for me doing this is because I am a parent. I have two children, a son who's five and a daughter who's seven. And because I have children and I think about the world that they're going to inherit, I'm terrified. I am terrified and I think a lot of people feel that way. Every single one of us is here, not just because we see logically how illogical or antithetical to our belief system government is, we see the direct impact it has on every single person in our lives. We have family members we care deeply about who are serving time in prison simply because they had the temerity to have marijuana. 
You have people who are incapable of advancing economically or starting a small business because of the huge burden government puts on them. We are always, we are in a situation as Americans where we are shackled by the very thing that we enacted supposedly to protect and serve us. And it's incumbent upon every single one of us to stand up and fight back. We need all hands on deck. That's why it's something that I've talked about multiple times is that our campaign is a volunteer organization made up of hundreds of a veritable who's who of awesome activists who've been in this movement right next to you this whole time. Every single one of us has to pick up a shovel and dig. There's myriad ways we can attack the Leviathan of the state, but we need to push back. Otherwise, our children will inherit a mess that we cannot fix for them. Thank you, Kim. Let's give a round of applause to all six candidates here tonight. Thank you to the South Carolina Libertarian Party for uh, inviting everyone uh, here, including myself and the National. There you go. Hi, my name is John, and I do the post-production on this debate. I want to thank a number of people that made this debate possible. The first would be Stuart Flood, the former chairman of the Libertarian Party of South Carolina, for having the vision and the audacity to try to put this together. Thank you for all of your hard work and putting together such a great event. I would like to thank the Executive Committee of the Libertarian Party of South Carolina for trusting me to try to turn this debate footage into something special because you guys did something great down there. I would also like to thank Sarah Shoemaker for providing some of the photos that were used in the opening graphics. Please check her out at LE Imagery. I would also like to thank the Mad Statist for designing our logo. This was just the first in a series of presidential debates that 3AL Productions will be assisting with, leading up to the National Convention in Austin, Texas. The next major debate that we will be assisting with is January 18th, with the debate hosted by the Libertarian Party of Georgia. While we don't have $25 million to spend like the DNC did producing one debate, we do have you guys and we can start to do something special and build something together. You can check out 3LProductions.net to find out different ways to support us. And also, you can do things that won't even cost you a cent. If you subscribe to our YouTube channel, with every Gmail account you have, once we reach 1,000 subscribers, we'll be able to unlock new features. You can also go like our Facebook page as well. That also helps with engagement and getting these debates out there. And something as simple as liking, commenting, and sharing the videos around really helps boost up the, their performance in the search algorithm. We're trying to build out more of the support network that our candidates need so our message can reach more people. This is grassroots politics at its most basic and raw level. Once again, thank you for watching, and I look forward to capturing and sharing with you the next debate, January 18th, with the Libertarian Party of Georgia hosting it at their state convention. Once again, thank you for watching.